Right. Sacred consortship. Are we going to wait for the others? No, I think just go for it. Okay. Just going to go. Yeah, just go. Je peux traduire ce qu'elle a dit en deux mots, mais vite fait comme ça, juste pour qu'on comprenne. Oui. Um, je vais comment? Je vais traduire. D'accord. Au fur et à mesure. Un peu au commencement. Ouais, juste. Un peu au fin. C'est juste pour donner. Pas facile pour tous les sentences. Que là, je comprends pas. Je comprends pas ce qui se passe. Alors, du coup, tu dois sentir. Oui, voilà. Tout à fait. Alors. Okay, so can I just introduce um, our friend Nama Prema Brace, who I've known for about 25 years. We met in Stonehenge, <coughs> I believe, at a Druid ritual. And then we went to Ireland together, we did peace rituals in Ireland, on Tara. And then, um, you know, we've done many works together. So this is her first time here to this house. So welcome to you and your magical sounds. And she's just been to the south of France visiting Mary Magdalene sites, all of them, and she's going to be sharing about her spiritual journey and her quest for peace, um, and uh, weaving into it her personal story plus more cosmic things. Anyway, over to you. Uh, Thank you. Can, can I welcome everybody who's joined us this afternoon? And can I just suggest we go around and say our names? So on dit le nom. Yeah, this I understand. Right. It's, uh, more, it's more the deeper. The, the, sure. The, the level I understand. The deeper, it's a bit complicated. Wait, right. on peut it's okay. plus tard. Wave at me or tell me if I speak too fast for you. It's not that you speak too fast, I think. It's that um, it's very deep comprehension, no? Yeah. And uh, it's more this way. It's not. but. It's okay. We je have vais, to je vais tour de Babel down. That's what I'll, I'll translate a bit. Don't slow yourself down. Okay, I won't. I'm going to whistle through this. No, really for one person, you can't. So, right. my name's Anna Pomegranate. <coughs> I'm Wendy. It's what? I'm Muriel. Muriel. Frédéric. Susan. Dr. Thomas Clough Daffer. <laughs> you know my name. <laughs> well, that's one of my many names. <laughs> Nicola. Nicola. Thank you for recording. So I'm going to whistle through what was going to be quite a lengthy presentation very fast <coughs> because um, we've already covered quite a lot of it so I'm going to cut about 20 slides out of it. So This is a personal experiential view. I'm not an academic and most of my experience of Mary Magdalene has been a personal experience. Um, and I'll talk about that as we go through. And that personal story and the empowerments that I have, have received raise a lot of questions for others to investigate. You know, it's not my job to investigate them. And just before the break, we had the lovely Susan really saying that Mary Magdalene was a mystic, and we'll look a little bit at that. And then I'll have a break after about half an hour, and then we'll do a guided visualisation where I will take you through um, a, a journey which will replicate and give you the opportunity to see what you experience yourselves. So, maybe I'm, no, not that one. <laughs> Press the space bar. Press the space bar. Yeah. Yes. And then it comes. So let's just ah, start. This way. Wait, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You see, I really don't understand. Yeah, you have to sit here. <laughs> yeah, I'm here because you're... So, let, let's start with just really all coming together to be here now, with a few deep breaths, and invite the enlightened illumination to come in each of, each of our hearts. And... See if we can just let go of the mind and be open to Mary Magdalene coming through us in this circle today. So just take a few deep breaths. As you breathe in, breathe in truth. As you breathe out, let go of anything that no longer serves you. with the earth beneath your feet, open to the heavens above you, and just imagine that you're under a waterfall of golden light falling through you, 
these energies of above and below, from all the directions around, centering in the heart. So just breathing into the heart. And breathing out from the heart. Just allowing ourselves to connect heart to heart with each person in the room. Just feeling the energy of a circle beginning to move clockwise through our hearts. As we open ourselves as a circle of truth. A circle of peace. A circle to share. And a circle to illuminate. So, from this place of heart, I offer this presentation. holiday, which I most like to do, be beside the water. This was in Tuscany on a pilgrimage last year to um, Assisi, where um, in the place where uh, St. Francis received the um, stigmata. stigmata, which is la something, I've forgotten it, la It'll come to me. Sorry, I have a terrible memory for names. I wasn't going to say this, but while I was in the chapel there, Mary Magdalene came and channeled through me last year, and that was a really amazing um, experience to be in that place um, of Francis. I think Francis was really important as a saint who really revolutionised the church. And for my money, he was an Indian guru who had lived in the hills and then came to be in the hills and the church had to change as a result of that. You'll usually see me with sound stuff. This was me at Colour Fest this year with my son. That's my big gong. Uh, very few of my Tibetan bowls. Uh, my Solfeggio chimes. And you can just see some of the crystal bowls that I work with. So I've got quite a lot of sound stuff that goes on. So, Mary, the Apostle of the Apostles. I want to share with you um, the experiences and understandings and questions that have been raised on this journey that I've had with Mary Magdalene and my awakening to the goddess over the last 25 years and to identify with you what her relevance might be for us today. And for me that's been a journey and I ask you to consider what your journey with her has been. Um, how have we come to her here today? What are we trying to achieve? Or what are we trying to learn? How are we doing this? I believe uh, in working in circles. Um, I believe a lot of the old paradigm of teaching with you know, the priest or the priestess at the front dishing out the stuff is not how it was and not how it needs to be and that we need to be working in circle and that that's really important. As we check out our hearts and our beings, how do we approach knowledge? Are we grasping for it? Or are we needing to heal some aspect of our psyche? Or maybe we're wanting to be the expert, needing to be the expert. Maybe we need to be heard. Mary Magdalene, I believe, needs to be heard at this time. Maybe we need to stand out. Maybe we're just needing to justify our existence. But can we just be with her, celebrating the essence, her essence? So I can look at my history and, you know, my name changes. I'll tell you all about that later, but in some of you I told last night, so I'm not going to go into that very much. And, you know, my list of qualifications, blah de blah not very much of it is very relevant 
Um, my big change came when I got my gong in 1994 and I became ordained as a Madonna minister in 1998 and worked in the Ministry of Mary for about five years. And then um, when I went up to the Himalayas and attended the Kala Chakra with um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that was a pretty good um, ego check out for me. Um, I worked a lot with Tom Kenyon, who's written an amazing book on the Magdalene, which is in the um, bibliography, and he is probably the best sound healer on the planet, and um, just quite awesome what he's written, and um, he relates a lot of the teachings that he's had from the Magdalene back to the Egyptian lineage, which we were talking about this morning, and particularly the rise of what he calls the Jed, and... Um, the bar and the car images. I mean, there's a whole teaching on it which I'm not going to go into. You have to read the book. But it, and there's um, sound transmissions and uh, CDs to go with it, which are really awesome. Now, I was fortunate to meet him in Glastonbury when he came to Glastonbury. One time he's been in England. And um, somebody who I, is very psychic said he released an energy in Glastonbury Tour, which Mar Mary Magdalene had put into Glastonbury Tour when she'd been there. And he also talked about her going up to Wales, and um, I subsequently did some pilgrimages up West Wales, and um, really found her energy very, very pre present, particularly in St David's um, at uh, Angel Mountain, and particularly at Strata Florida, which again relates to the Egyptian teachings, and at Strata Florida Well, which was absolutely one of the most precious experiences of my life being at Strata Florida well. So um, I think yes, she was definitely a well-travelled lady really. Um, when I moved from the Madonna Ministry I went to work um, at supporting the Heart of Living Yoga with Papa Davy, and that has been an amazing journey in opening the heart and um, I'll come to that in a minute. So for me when we look at any of these things, the experience of it and the process of it is more important. The how we do things is more important than why we do them or what we're doing. And I just think that's important to note as well. I had some very, very amazing teachers and my root teacher was Jessica Macbeth, who is an amazing poet. And um, she wrote two amazing books called Sun Over Mountain and Moon Over Water, which are guides to guided visualisation, how to create them, and guides to meditation. She lives in um, just off the coast of Seattle now and does a huge amount of work on the internet and on Second Life. Um, and I just feel really privileged because she taught me so much. And the first time I went to her meditation, which I went to for about five years, her meditation group, you know, she started talking about the goddess. And for me, um, I'd ignored the goddess. You know, I was brought up a quite an ordinary Christian person, you know, Sunday school and Church of England. And, you know, when she said goddess, I was going like, oh, I don't know if I can touch that. Little thinking that I'd be teaching goddess mysteries <laughs> 25, 30 years down the line. So, you know, it was really, um, but I really bless her for everything that she shared with me. And from her, I went to do some teachings with Lama Ganshan Rinpoche, who, um, again, Thomas and I went to some teachings that he did and some empowerments that he did. He used to come regularly to Gaunt's house. And he is probably an emanation of the, um, the healing Buddha, the medicine Buddha. And he shared with me how to open up Stonehenge to work. And he taught me how to use sound in Stonehenge and how to use... Um, how to work with groups really, it, with sound. And, and the first time I was there, uh, he was in the centre doing his practice with a group of people. And I, I was, I'd had this bowl actually, and was holding the energy for about 70 people who weren't allowed in the stones. And, um, you know, one can get a bit sort of like, oh gosh, am I really doing this? Is this what I'm really meant to be doing? And, but I just kept playing the bowl, and he was eyeballing me from the centre of the circle. 
And when he came out of the circle, he took my hand and he walked the entire length of Stonehenge car park with me, which was a real confirmation that I'd been doing what he wanted done. And um, I mean, when he touches you, I mean, my arm was like burning for about two days afterwards, you know. And uh, he, we went to a peace meeting at the House of Lords. I was sitting next to him at the House of Lords. And he put his hand on my knee halfway through. And he was healing my knees while I was sitting in this meeting in the, the um, House of Lords. It was very bizarre, but very amazing. And he's, um, I'll just show you a thing. That, that this is his work, some of his words. At the dawn of the third millennium, democracy, human rights, justice and peace have become crucial to address as we face ever-increasing violence, unrest and wars. The present world situation calls for urgent and long-term solutions. Surely the time has come for this seed to grow and to help bring peace to our planet. Numerous spiritual and interreligious organisations and leaders are actively working for peace worldwide in many different ways. Lama Ganshan appreciates and supports the efforts of all organisations and initiatives towards the one aim of peace, wishing for all to unite in a common forum under the auspices of the United Nations, a gift for world peace in the third millennium. And, you know, that to me is a pretty laudable aim, really. And I think it's absolutely in alignment with what I would see as the mission of Yeshua and Mary Madden. Uh, this, is, incidentally, is a picture of the stupa that he has built in northern Italy at a place called Albagnano, overlooking Lake Maggiore. Uh, it's really worth going to visit. Energetically, um, he's anchored, I don't know what relics he's got, uh, got there, but he's anchored a Tara energy that is going out hundreds of miles, absolutely hundreds of miles. Amazing place to be. From him, I discovered this mandala. Um, and he was very into multi-faith work and um, I was at one of his teachings and somebody introduced me to Swami Satchitananda's work which is truth is one and paths are many and this is a mandala that represents all the major religions here uh, including uh, all the ones not named at the bottom and all those yet to be discovered at the top and this uh, mandala is um, built into the stupa that he has, or it's a temple that he has, the Lotus Temple at Yogaville in Virginia, in Buckland County, Virginia. And it was that really that led me to work with him. And this is what I would see to be my lineage, really, of integral yoga. This is Gurudev um, addressing all the crowds at Woodstock, which is when he really came to prominence in the West. He was the guru who blessed the Woodstock Festival. He was an amazing interfaith visionary. He met, met the Pope. When he got met the Pope, he himself had the um, stigmata of Christ come. Um, this is him with a lion. He could just talk to animals, no problem. And this is him in his death. And his, um, his body is now... In, he attained Mount Masamadi 2002. And this is the stupa, which has got a central light coming by down through the centre and then altars to all the major religions in it. So it's a very physical teaching, in the same way that Lama Ganshan, who built, um, God, what's the temple complex in Java? Brugador. Lama Ganshan, in a past life, built that. And he goes and does teaching there every year, which must be an amazing thing to do. Anyway, so I took an um, initiation, mantra initiation with him. And one of the things that this lineage of gurus teaches me is it teaches me the attitudes that I believe Yeshua brought back from India, because I believe he did go to India and look was taught in India. And that the things that I've learned in this tradition actually transfer to a Yeshua tradition. And they're things like um, karma yoga, service, bhakti yoga, delighting in the joy, in the sound, in the freedom. Um, and that's, uh, and Raja Yoga, which he is a master of yoga, Ma Raja Yoga is really embracing all the different paths to truth and to peace. So that was very um, important. And of course I've been doing all this work with all these men 
and the um, male lineages, and in the process, healing a lot of stuff with my father, you know, which I think is what happens when you have a guru. They, you, you start to heal certain things. And I needed to heal the mother, and I've done some of that with Jessica Macbeth. And then I came and met, met Amma, who is an absolute inspiration. If you, none of you, if any of you get a chance to meet Amma, she is a walking saint on this planet. She is Yeshua in incarnation. She is Mary Magdalene in incarnation. I mean, what she does is physically impossible for any human being to do. And um, the energy that she generates is absolutely extraordinary. And she just is the hugging saint. She just hugs people all the time. But also, she's done various talks to very learned things. I once heard a talk, they projected a talk she'd done. And I mean, it was worthy of, you know, any university professor of women's liberation talking. It was so astute. So we come into this journey of discovering the Divine Feminine through Mary Magdalene. And, you know, this is the sort of traditional view that we're given of Mary Magdalene, isn't it? Of her washing Jesus' feet. And this is the view that has been perpetuated by the church. And um, I think that the pictures we saw of these women walking with the um, bowls of water on their head are much more accurate as to what was happening. And I think the Gospel of Mary is a really significant shift from what we've been given from the church. And this is a quote here from um, the Gospel of Mary. I saw the Lord in a vision and I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said to me, Blessed are you that you did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is the treasure. I said to him, so now, Lord, does a person who sees a vision see it through the soul or through the spirit? And then there's pages missing. But in this conversation, you know, he's teaching that the inner self is composed of soul, spirit, mind, and a third mind that is between the two that sees the vision. And um, she, when she recounts the revelation in that Gospel of Mary, um, she's really describing an ascent of the soul as it passes to its final rest. And um, there's a woman called Karen King, who I haven't actually read, but I did get this off the internet, so I know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Karen King, she actually wrote a book called The Gospel of Mary, which is in the bibliography. She says it presents a radical interpretation of Jesus' teachings as a path to inner spiritual knowledge. It rejects his suffering and death as the path to eternal life. And it exposes the erroneous view that Mary of Magdala was a prostitute for what it is, a piece of theological fiction. It presents the most straightforward and convincing argument in any early Christian writing for the legitimacy of women's leadership. It offers a sharp critique of illegitimate power and a utopian vision of spiritual perfection. And it challenges our rather romantic views about the harmony and unanimity of the first Christians. And it asks us to rethink the basis for church authority. And, you know, there have been two other fragments of these same thing, this Gospel of Mary. So it was actually found three times and it didn't actually come out in translation, I think, to about maybe 1955, so you know, but it was discovered I think in 1897 originally. So it's actually not a new find, but the translation is fairly new, and the, obviously people are studying it and what have you. What's it actually saying? I think what it's saying is that it's okay to be psychic and see visions, and in fact, our whole Bible is built on that seeing visions. All the prophets saw visions, you know. Uh, and yet that whole thing of channeling and being a visionary has been excluded from our experience within the church, you know, um, even though we're honouring a lot of people who were psychics, surprisingly. And um, it's also saying it's okay for women to be leaders. And I was reading something this morning, there are splits, you know, between the male delivery of the teachings that came through Peter and even in this Gospel of Mary, it's shown that that split was beginning to develop between Peter and Mary. And um, 
that you know maybe he resented that she had special teachings and that he was at a different level. I mean, I don't think there needed to be a competition because I see that there's room for a lot of difference. And I see that there's different vibrations of teachings and that different people at different stages of development need different teachings. So the, the church teachings from Peter are valid for those people for whom they're valid for. And the teachings from Mary Magdalene are valid for the teachings you know, of people who can sort of follow her. Anyway, so King concludes that both the content and the text structure lead the reader inward towards the identity, power and freedom of the true self, the soul set free from the powers of matter and the fear of death. So, I think that's quite an interesting little quote, really. What's her name? A King, a Karen King. Karen King. Karen King. So, who was Yeshua? Um, I saw this quote the other day, I rather liked it, on Facebook. <laughs> I like Facebook. From the Bible we can infer Jesus was a radical, a non-violent revolutionary who hung around with lepers, hookers and crooks. He wasn't American, he never spoke, in, spoke English, was anti-wealth, anti the death penalty and even anti-public prayer. But was never anti-gay, never mentioned abortion or birth control, never called the poor lazy, never justified torture, never fought for tax cuts for the wealthiest, never asked for a leper for a copay. He was long-haired, brown-skinned, homeless, community organising, anti-slut-shaming, Middle mm -hmm. Eastern Jew. Fact of the matter is, by today's standards, he could be considered a communist. <laughs> so I thought that was rather a, a, a nice yeah. thing, because it sort of challenges our view a bit. And, I mean, Thomas said this morning that um, he was cultured and educated, and I think he was very cultured and very educated. But there are a lot of very cultured, educated hippies who hang out today. You know? And... Um, also, the other thing, last year I was at the Sound and Silence Festival and I had the privilege of hearing Estas Ton play guitar. And I came away after what was really a biblical experience, is the only way I can describe it, feeling like they never told us that Jesus played the lyre. <laughs> mm. And, you know, maybe they were playing amazing music and this was like a rock concert when everybody gathered on the thing. You know, we never think about that. So, the power of attention in the heart with the mind in service. There's also a hint in this Gospel of Mary that Yeshua understands the power of the mind and what we might now call the power of intention to manifest. And I think it's very interesting when we set up to go on a pilgrimage that, um, I mean, I set this pilgrimage that I've just been on um, and have shared a little with some of you, that... Um, it was a pilgrimage in the footsteps of the Magdalene. And when you set an intention, it manifests. When you're in the heart, it manifests. And amazing synchronistics ha happen, synchronicities. Fantastic synchronicities. So that is really... And I think that's one of the problems that we'll come to about channeling as well, is in terms of intention. And also very important when we come to ceremony, that for me, the intention when you're working with sound or ceremony is absolutely crucial and critical. What I've discovered is that Magdalene mysteries are absolutely shrouded by the shadows of projection and emotional overlay identification, and that literally creates veils of illusion. So when you go to these sites, it's like you're peeling back um, the veils. Yeshua said, um, apparently in the Place of Sophia, that Magdalene and John the Virgin will tower over all my disciples and all men shall receive the mysteries. Interesting. I believe the time's now. It has to be now. We haven't got a lot of time before we've polluted the earth to a point where we'll eliminate humans and give it several thousand years to recover, because the earth will go on, but... Um, you know, whether the humans will is another question. It's time to arise now, and importantly, to balance. For me, the importance of Mary Magdalene is in her ability to re-energise and re-inspire women throughout the world, and also hopefully men. But particularly those people who've had a history of imbalance or who've had leanings to Christianity and who can identify with her. You know, because there are an awful lot of women who've experienced a lot of put-downs, and 
as I mentioned this morning, you know, when people have been abused um, or distressed, they need to be heard. And that little thing I read, I just saw it this morning when you were passing that book. And I thought that actually, whether it's true or not, it was a really beautiful piece about how somebody who was maybe feeling in a lot of shame, maybe she had been raped, maybe she wasn't the prostitute that we are told that she was, but he loved her and loved her back to health. And I think that there's a lesson there for all of us how we can love people back to health, you know, and sometimes have miraculous healings as a result. And we can do that by helping people to be heard, to become whole, to trust, to have faith in themselves, and to create positive, balanced relationships that honour themselves and command respect. So. The impact of visiting these sites for me, when I go into a sacred site, um, I like to really be in silence and to go into my heart and to just sit and let the sight act on me and um, observe what comes. And as you drop into the heart, and that is a teaching which I think we all need, is how to meditate in the heart. Um, you know, one becomes strengthened, and just sometimes there's a whisper in your ear from something that just things, and for me sometimes that's been a past life remembrance, sometimes it's a little teaching, I'll show, tell you the teaching I got this time, and uh, yeah, just going in and being in silence is for me very important, and when I was in the uh, K, the sanctuary of St. Marie de la Mer, which is the place where uh, the two Marys came in, as, according to them, not the three Marys, the two Marys. They say Mary Salome and Mary Jac Jacobi came in there with Sarah. They don't actually say Mary Magdalene comes in, came in there, which is interesting. Um, in a boat without oars and probably with some other men with them as well. And maybe with a bag of gold so that they could make their way, who knows. Anyway, um, these two, I have a particular affinity with uh, Mary Salome, who I believe was the sister of, the younger sister of Mother Mary, and she was about 12 years, yes she was senior, and had two sons, James and John, because she was married to Zebedee, probably, and her sons would have been about seven and five when he was about 12, so, you know, it was if you, you begin to get a picture of this family around Yeshua and that some of these disciples were actually members perhaps of his family. <coughs> they may have been people he considered like his younger brothers, you know, that he would take out to play in the fields. And, you know, they would listen avidly when he came back from his travels. If he came, went to England when he was seven with... Joseph of Arimathea, you, they'd come, you know, big brothers back, Uncle Jesus, we're going to sit and listen here. And um, I think that explains why Mary Salome, who originally was Helena Salome, apparently, from, I'll tell you where I get this from in a minute, but Helena Salome, um, but then took the name of Mary because everyone in this Essene community, which became the Magdalene community, probably took the name of Mary and Yeshua. That was partly as a protection because um, you know, it was like a title. And so it means that many of the stories that we've maybe got about Yeshua or Mary may not have been about one Yeshua, but may have been about several people. You know, one doing something in India, one doing something in Wales, what bloody blah. Anyway, so. This site, this popped in, and I felt it's just important to acknowledge that you know, what our knowledge is, is partly the truth, and it's partly this thing about projection.